morning, everyone. Uh, this morning's scripture reading is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22, the conversion of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananus, oh boy, I practice this word, Ananias. The Lord said to him with a vision, Ananias, he answered, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and laying his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked his name? And he has not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Before we listen to God's word, let us bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, we bow before you in the name of Jesus and as we've just read from your word, we now pray that your spirit will open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives to receive your message, a message of transformation, a message that can change who we are. May you bless us now with your word in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So when I grew up in South Africa, there were about 12 different provinces. And uh, <clears throat> each year there was a, a prestigious national rugby tournament. If you don't know what rugby is, that's the, uh, you know, the same as football, except you don't play with helmets. It's like for the real men, you know, the, the <laughs> game of rugby. <clears throat> but in any case, so there was this <clears throat> national rugby tournament called Craven Week. It was named after a famous Springbok rugby player in South Africa, Donny Craven. Uh, where a high school team from each province competed against each other. 
and it was a real honor to be picked and represent your province at this tournament. Now, I'm almost 60 years old, but it's amazing how you can remember certain things from your childhood. And when I was 14 years old, my dad came up to me and uh, he had a sizable amount of money in his hand. And he said to me, do you see this money? I'm putting it away now for when you go to Craven Week one day. And uh, four years later, I was selected as fly half and vice captain for the Eastern Free State side. And uh, my dad, you know, must have seen something in me. And he believed in me. And I'm sure that was a big part of why I went on to represent my province at this national tournament. And maybe you have a similar story of when someone believed in you to do or achieve something and it made a difference in your life. Or maybe someone wrote you off and it somehow motivated you. Or maybe someone said, you know what, you'll never amount to anything in this life and, and it discouraged you completely. Maybe you're working with young people and, uh, and over the years you have seen gifts and potential in some students and, and you have helped them realize it. In our culture, there's an increasing temptation to write people off or to make judgments about them. Nothing good can come from the South or from the West Coast, or from people who belong to this political party, or that political party, or this culture, or that culture, or this country, or that country. And people's fears are being stoked, and their judgments or fears are keeping them from connecting, or interacting, or seeing the potential in someone else. Over the last two weeks, we focused on first Thomas and then Peter. And today we're looking at another story of redemption, a story of change, a story of hope. Remember, faith in a risen Jesus can transform our lives and make it better here and now. And the Bible says, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. No matter how big or how small we fall, God stretches out his hand ready to raise us up and help us live a new life, to walk in newness of life. In this passage, we see that Saul was breathing threats and murder against the early Christians. And he really believes he's faithful, okay? He's doing what he is supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be persecuting the Christ followers of the early church. What's interesting is that Ananias also believes he's faithful and doing the right thing. He knows too much about Saul, and he won't be fooled into thinking that this guy has changed. And they both refer to the voice speaking to them as Lord. And so you have Saul, who persecuted the faith of Christians because they did not believe like him, and you have Ananias, who had preconceived ideas about Saul and wanted nothing to do with him at first. But God gets to decide 
who the instruments are in his band and the part that they are going to supposed to play. Now from our perspective it is easy to see what Saul is doing as hateful. He's threatening to kill the followers of Jesus. He's persecuting Christians. And I'm sure we're saying to ourselves, you know, I'm certainly not hateful as Saul is hateful. And so it's probably easier for all of us to to relate to Ananias. He wanted nothing to do with Saul, but for the right reasons, we think. I mean, come on, Saul was persecuting his people. And I guess we will say that the degree and uh, expression of the negative feelings that Ananias has towards Saul are certainly different and less harmful than Saul's animosity towards the Christians. But I want you to notice something. In both cases, God seeks to overcome the judgment and the animosity with connection for the sake of the gospel, with interaction for the sake of of his greater project of love. Their connection and interaction with Jesus and then with one another. And just like in the case with Thomas and Peter, the risen Jesus meets with Saul and Ananias. In Saul's case, there's a bright light and voice and in Ananias' case, in a vision. And Jesus meets them both in their sin of hatred and judgment and being closed off to other people. And it takes an encounter with the risen Jesus to transform them, to help them overcome their judgment and animosity. And then God's Spirit raises both Saul and Ananias up to be strong followers faithful followers of Jesus. And the power of the risen Christ enables them to then work together for the sake of the gospel. Now when Jesus meets them, he gives both of them an instruction. He gives each of them a call that they must answer for themselves. He says to Saul, now get up And go into the city where you will be told what to do. And he says to Ananias, get up and go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. And when you get there, you will find a man named Saul from the city of Tarsus. Saul is praying and has seen a vision. And so Jesus says to both of them, get up and go. And they both do. They both obey him. And in doing so, Saul becomes Paul. He goes from persecuting Christians to becoming probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. He becomes the central figure in early Christianity and he ends up writing most of the New Testament. His importance to the early church and beyond can simply not be overstated. And his theology is the foundation of the Christian faith. So what a change and and transformation. And so if God could overcome Saul's violent hatred and raise him up to become Paul, is there anything that God cannot do or forgive? Is there anyone God cannot transform And work through. Think about your worst ever sin. Maybe you have the seemingly unforgivable sin in your life. I want you to see yourself in Paul's story. And what the power of Christ can and will do. 
And I want to ask you to contemplate this. Where is God calling you to get up and go beyond the place of your fear and your judgment? Are there ways that you are prematurely condemning others, judging others? And is it keeping you from seeing their God-given potential? Is it preventing you from even interacting with them in the first place? You may be harboring hatred or judgment that could be preventing you from following God's call on your life. And if so, I want you to imagine that other person as Jesus saying to you, why do you persecute me? What if in obedience to Christ you could get let go, you could let go of your fear and your prejudice and even your hatred? Do you think that might just transform and change your life and, and how you see other people? The good news is because of Jesus, God does not judge you. He does not condemn you. My dad saw something in me. He saw how I played rugby and he believed in me. And your heavenly father sees the best in you. There's no prejudice or condemnation. He believes in your potential. And he wants you not to judge or condemn the people you fear or the people you don't prefer. He wants you to be open to the Spirit, to change your heart and your opinions about other people. He wants you to be transformed as well. You know, often we... We expect God to call and use only people like us. People just like us in our community, in our church, with our preferred set of gifts and graces or maybe even baggage. Surely God's on our side, right? Instead of prioritizing our opinions of them. We need to learn to hear God's truth about others. To see in others what God sees in them. What would happen if Israelis and Palestinians could let go of their prejudices? and their judgments, and their hatred for one another. Or the protesters and the counter-protesters on our college campuses. Or if Republicans and Democrats are able to do that. Because God forbid if they dare to reach across the aisle. Or the factions in Sudan or Ethiopia, or the gangs in Haiti, or Russia and Ukraine, and Azerbaijan and Armenia, and on and on and on. God's Spirit can change hearts. And He can transform people, and He can transform nations. We are living in a divided world. We're living in a divided country. 
a world in which hatred can bubble up even in the hearts of those who seek to do good. So may God reveal to us what kinds of hatred and judgment we excuse and justify. And may the risen Christ move us from a place of judgment to a place of connection so that we can work together for the sake of God's kingdom. Amen. Let us pray. Lord our God, we bring to you today in the name of Jesus our prejudices, our judgments, the way we condemn others, even the way we, we dislike or even hate other groups or other people. And we confess it as a sin. We are not the judge, you are. So help us to see the potential <clears throat> and the good in others, or at least help us to be able to connect with other people and not just write them off. May your spirit enable us to, to rise from our hatred and judgment and condemnation so we can all work together for the sake of your love and your kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.